welcome everyone. Uh, so um, excited to see you all here today. Um, and uh, I am uh, Derek Hosberg. I'm calling in from San Francisco, which is on the land of the Ohlone people. And if you would like to share where you're calling in from today, we, we always love to see just, you know people come from all over the world often. Um, and I know that we have a really a wonderful conversation today. So I wanna, I don't wanna take uh, much time from it. Um, I do wanna say that um, this will be, uh, we're gonna go on a little pause with holding space um, while Claire writes her many books that she's working on right now. Um, but we will be back um, most likely in, in the summer or the fall. So we'll keep you posted. Um, but uh, I um, wanted to just uh, do to start off by saying I have so much gratitude for Claire. Um, it really has been amazing working with her, and I just want to say she is as lovely as she seems on the show. <laughs> she, <laughs> but, um, really, yeah. Um, I, I mean, I think a lot of people are as lovely as they seem, but like she really does. Um, so. <laughs> Thanks, Tara. So. <laughs> Okay, well, today um, you're all in for a treat. Um, we have uh, Claire in conversation um, with Dr. Amy Robbins, um, who we've already done uh, a couple of events with and who I've actually gotten to know quite well and become friends with. And um, I find her fascinating and I'm sure you will too. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll share a little bit more about her in a moment, um, but I wanted to just uh, share a few things um, that uh, we always do at the beginning of these events. Uh, first, I just wanted to, to give a big shout out and a thank you to our 2021, um, or I guess now will be 2022 sponsors uh, who help make this work possible. I also just wanna say a huge thank you to all who donated. Um, we actually uh, reached our little end of year fundraising goal, which is so awesome. And, um, you know, just to say that if you're interested in supporting the Imagine, you can always go to our website and, and donate there. Um, it makes these events uh, free and, and possible. Uh, and then I just wanted to also highlight um, that, um, uh, you know, just the different functionality for Zoom, which you all should know. Um, unfortunately, I, I don't think I have the closed captioning um, setting uh, turned on so i'm going to try to figure that out um, during uh while they're talking um but i wanted to say that we encourage you all to put your questions your comments in the chat throughout um the session and there will be a q a portion um towards the end um where claire will be grabbing questions um from there so please um you know feel free uh to to add things um and with that um, i'm just going to do a brief uh, introduction for Claire and Amy. Um, so Claire is an internationally renowned author, speaker, and grief expert. She's the author of three books of nonfiction, The Rules of Inheritance, After This, When Life is Over, Where Do We Go, and Anxiety, The Missing Stage of Grief. And she has some more books on the way, um, but I would highly recommend those. And then um, for Dr. Amy Robbins, and hold on one second while I pull this up. Um, so she is a clinical psychologist, spiritual, intuitive, wellness speaker, and host of the hugely successful podcast, Life, Death, and the Space Between, which I'll add a link to um, in a moment. And as a clinical psychologist with a private practice in Chicago and through her own experiences with loss, she has been exploring the spiritual world for years on her own and on her podcast in her way of sharing her insights and ex exploration about what happens when we die and how we can use that to live better now. Um, and with that, I will let you take it away. Thank you so much, Dara, and Reimagine. I'm so happy to be here, even if we're gonna go on a pause for a bit. And there are so many great um, episodes of this that are still in the archives. If, you, if you're missing, if you're missing holding space, there's there's more on the internet. Um, but for now, I'm really excited to talk to you, Dr. Amy Robbins. Hi, welcome. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. I'm sort of a fan, a big, big fan of yours. So this is such an honor for me today. Oh, thank you. We have so much crossover in our work and in our kind of life philosophy. So um, for those who aren't familiar with you, can you just start by just telling us about yourself and the work you do? 
Sure. So I'm a clinical psychologist. I have a private practice in Chicago. I see about 20 patients a week. That's crept up more and more <laughs> over this past two years. Yeah. Um, I also am the director of mental health at a holistic wellness club in Chicago. It's a new kind of concept. And so I'm excited to be a part of that. And I have my podcast called Life, Death, and the Space Between, uh, which is an exploration of life, death, consciousness, and what it all means. Um, I'm also a mom. I have three kids. They're 15, 12, and eight today. Aww. My baby. Yes, my baby. Um, and so I'm just, just a regular human trying to get through the day. <laughs> what makes your work different from a regular typical therapist? You know, I think that in in practice, you know, what you might see is doesn't look all that different. Um, I work, I do, I have a traditional kind of long-term psychotherapy model that I work with really exploring um, early childhood experiences, how those shape our later relationships, the power of the unconscious, how to help people recognize when they are responding from an unconscious place and really trying to work to make that unconscious conscious. Hmm. However, I have a big spiritual bent. And so I'm always thinking about how in the, in the collective kind of cosmos, how this one's experience in their life is connected to perhaps past life experiences how they might be using what they're experiencing to look at as lessons for growth mm -hmm. and change so they can evolve their soul. So not, I, I don't always say that to people because certainly way <laughs> back in the day um, when I was sort of emerging, when the spiritual side of me was really emerging, many of my referral sources are physicians from Northwestern Hospital. Yeah. So it was a struggle of like, how do I, how do I straddle these two worlds of really grounded psychological theory and practice, but mm -hmm. also this spiritual, I this spiritual transformative experience that I had had that I'm sure we'll get into in just a minute. Yeah. And, and knowing that I can't go back to traditional ways of thinking because yeah, once that door opens, there's no closing it. Yeah, no matter how hard I've tr I tried to shove it closed, and I did, it just kept, kept yeah. coming back. So um, certainly now my patients know this sort of other side of me, and it gets integrated because it's part of me. Sure. And in our work, as you know, is we can't separate who we are. I don't think good therapists separate who they are from no. the work they're doing. I agree. Well, so tell us about your spiritual awakening and, and yeah. So when I was uh, 18, I lost my aunt. She um, had juvenile onset diabetes. She mm. was waiting for a kidney and pancreas transplant. And while she was waiting, she was moving up the list. They realized that they needed to make sure that her body would have been strong enough to withstand that transplant. Mm -hmm. um, they went in to do open heart surgery because her heart was weak. And when they got in there, her arteries and everything were like sticks. They like mm -hmm. could break them with their fingers. Um, and she, they were unable to revive her heart. So she died on the table. Mm -hmm. um, she was 48, which for me now is, as I approach that age, has a whole yeah. new um, perspective. It's so much younger, right? Than you probably <laughs> thought it was. Right, right. And even yeah. then it seemed, she seemed young to me, but now it's like holy cow like there was a whole life that she never lived yeah. um and she was very my family is extremely close and so she was like a second mother to me in mm -hmm. many ways she had also gone through a really terrible divorce which i think led to a lot of the um physical deterioration of her body having diabetes and you know back then the treatments were very different and um, and so I had a lot of associations at the time about what her life meant in terms of my life. I was the oldest of three kids. She was the oldest of three kids, same exact birth order. Like there were a lot of kind of psychological associations that I had made to that. And I just um, graduate, I, I was in college. I came home for a couple of days, we're Jewish. We had a Shiva and then I went right back to school. Mm -hmm and never really processed the grief. 
but over time it manifested itself as as grief as it does, does. <laughs> as it does um as anxiety for me and the anxiety was is my life going to end up like hers am i going to die like she did um kind of really spinning i need to create a very different life than she had because she was weak i saw her as very weak um as very reliant on her ex-husband and that's kind of how she got herself into the situation so i really went on a journey in therapy to yeah. kind of explore and understand all of this. And then I went back to grad school uh, for psychology, which was not my initial plan. And about her son, who was my cousin, is four years older than me and we were pretty close and he was getting ready to get married. Uh, shortly before his wedding, I had what I now know was a visitation from her. And I recognize after this one that I had had previous ones that I thought mm -hmm. were dreams um, where she came to me and she, what I saw was two very clear images. The first one was she was, we, she and I were in my mom's kitchen and my mom was standing at the dishwasher washing dishes. And my aunt said to me, please tell your mom I'm gonna be there. I'm gonna be at the wedding. And then the other image was her talking to my uncle, her brother, and he was pushing a stroller. And she said, tell him that I hear him when he talks to me, when mm -hmm. he's out walking. And I'm there and I hear him and tell him to keep talking to me. So I woke up and I knew at the time it was very different from any other dream I had experienced. It was not that like amalgamation of pieces. Yeah. It was very clear. The images today are as clear to me as they were, this was almost 15, 20 years ago. Yeah. Um, and, and so I called my mom and I said, mom, I had this dream last night. And Aunt Linda came to me and she said to me, you don't have to be upset. She's gonna be at the wedding. And my mom started crying and she said, I was standing at the kitchen sink last night talking to her and I said, I can't believe you're not going to be at this wedding. Oh, I have chills. <laughs> Good. And so I, I I called and then my mom was crying and I'm crying and I don't know what to make of this. And I call my uncle and I tell him this portion. And he says, that's when I always talk to her is when I'm out running. And I talk to her about his, he talks to her about his son mm. who was born with a facial um, hemangioma. And at the time she died when, he was five, her, my, my uncle's son was five. Um, and so this was a real like struggle in his life at that mm -hmm. point. Um, and so I kind of, I went to school that day. I had a professor who I loved, who was very, very grounded in psychoanalytic psychotherapy, but also taught classes on indigenous healing. And I told her I had had this experience. What do I do? And she said, I think you're opening up. And I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> what does that mean? Yeah. Um, and I kind of dismissed it. And then I put it away. I continued with grad school. I was still in therapy at the time, but something shifted in me and my anxiety dissipated. And that fear of death that I now realize was driving so much of my anxiety wasn't as, as um, profound anymore. Yeah. It was really much quieter mm -hmm. um and and then my grandfather passed away and it happened again with a message and then it started happening with patients loved ones and i was like whoa <laughs> this, this isn't working for me was it always in this kind of dream form or was it was it happening when you were awake or so it was always happening in that, like what I, like the five to seven time or whatever it is for anybody else who wakes up and then kind of drifts back into that in-between state. Yeah. Um, but then it did start happening in session where I would get like flashes of people's, what I think was their past lives. But again, I don't know for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and so I really felt like, okay, now I have to figure out how to integrate and use all this and understand what this all means in this larger context of the world and yeah. how how to work with people with this because people weren't coming to me to 
talk to their dead loved ones. They were yeah. coming to me for help with, with a multitude of things, not necessarily grief. Uh, and so I spent many years kind of trying to sort through and figure out what what this all meant. And what did that look like? I mean, were you, um, I mean, you would have to, I, I can't imagine you wouldn't want to really start to try to find some kind of framework for these experiences and like what your thoughts about past lives or afterlife. So wh where did you dive into to, to kind of start looking for that? So I had read, which I feel like is everybody's sort of like gateway drug to this world, which is Brian Weiss's work on many, many lives, many masters, um, which I had read when I was 18 years old and was captivated by it. Yeah. So I went back to that. And then my professor actually said, I have a medium who I think you should talk to. Uh -huh. and so I had, re I reached out to this woman and I spent two years working with her kind of as an apprentice. Oh. trying to learn from her, trying to understand what this was. And it was always this back and forth with me, this push pull of like, is this really real? Am I making this up? Mm -hmm. I'm so, I mean, my grandfather was a pediatrician. My uncle is an orthopedic surgeon, all very grounded in yeah. scientific um, materialism. And I just, so I, I've always kind of grappled with could this be still to this day, I grapple with it. And then I'm like hit over the head with, I'll call them my guides, but mm -hmm. loved ones, whomever, source, whatever you sort of want to call it with like, are you seriously still questioning this? <laughs> Come yeah. on, have we not shown you enough? Um, but so I spent two years doing that. I also took classes. There's a there's a foundation, there's a center in Chicago called the Infinity Foundation that offers classes in this space with um you know exploring spirit guides and shaman journeys and mediumship and so i did that for a while and then pulled back from it again uh and then moved into it again i had someone reach out to me saying let's i hear you're interested in this let's do some experimenting and i was like okay and so i did she was like let's do co-readings together so i did this reading with a woman that I'm friendly with, but not friends. And she, in the reading, her father-in-law came through and he had some messages, but the main thing was he showed me a blue ring with a stone on it and, or a, like a, yeah, a ring with a blue stone. And it was very clear. And I described it to my friend and she went back to her husband and she said, um, she saw this ring and her husband was like, my dad didn't wear jewelry. Like that was not something that was ever, mm -hmm. like, he ever had anything. And he went home that weekend to Philadelphia. His mom walks out minutes after he gets there and says, I just found this ring of your dad's. I feel like he would want you to have it. Oh my and God. He, yeah. <laughs> and immediately my friend sends me the picture and I'm blown away. My heart's racing. I'm like, okay, maybe I should do a little more with this. So I did what was called, as I'm trying, as you know, in the in the field, like we're always trying to create frameworks, like you said. Yeah. So I'm like trying to create a framework for myself around how I can make this possible. And I said, I reached out to a bunch of friends and colleagues and said, I'm going to try this. I'm going to do readings for a month. If you're interested, let me know. And I did three months worth of readings. And then I just decided this is not for me. Yeah. <laughs> Why wasn't it for you? What happened? I think one, I, I don't believe I, this is really my gift. I think that there are mediums out there who are so incredibly talented and they were born to do this work. It, it is who they are. They can get information. They can just call it in and it happens. Mm -hmm. I think for me, it's more what I just learned actually this week in recording a podcast is that it's more a spontaneous experience for me. I think I'm, I learned I'm an adept, so I'm more open to these experiences, mm -hmm. but I just felt like a medium reading has such a powerful ability to heal when people are grieving. Yeah. And it has to be done with the utmost integrity and skill and um, authenticity 
and it's not something to be taken lightly. It's a tool in the grieving process. And I would never, ever have wanted someone to come to me and feel like it wasn't top notch. Mm -hmm. And I don't feel like I could deliver that consistently for people. And so now I recommend it as a tool for people and I'm careful who I recommend. Yeah, gosh, we're, um, we've done such similar stuff. So, you know, you mentioned you had read my, my book called After This, which is my journey of trying to find my own spiritual framework for the grief and death work that I do. And I started seeing psychic mediums, gosh, over 10 years ago, like 12, 13 years ago. And, you know, some of it was just kind of like, I made a promise to a friend who was dying in our twenties that I would go and try to check on her. Um, I did it a little bit out of curiosity. I was a grief counselor in hospice at the time that I started seeing psychic mediums. And I was really worried too. I, I, you know, I started out doing it as research for a book and also doing it as research for the clients that I have that were seeing psychic mediums. You know, they were coming to me in grief sessions and saying, I saw a psychic medium and this is what happened. And this is how it impacted me. And I was like, I really need to see, I, I want to experience what they're experiencing just so I can know how to work with them yeah. after they've done this. But I was so worried. You know, the first one I went to see, I went to see John Edward, um, the pretty famous psychic medium. Mm -hmm. And I, I paid a bunch of money and I flew to New York to go. And, and I was like, oh my God, who are the people who are going? Like they must be in so much grief if they're paying this much money, if they're flying this far. I mean, people had flown in from all around the world to see him. And it just wasn't this big, scary thing that I thought it was going to be. It was actually so much more uplifting and inspiring and connective. Mm -hmm. um, and I still wasn't sure if it was real. And I still, I'm not sure if it's real. You know, there's all these different layers of it, but I found it to be just the sense of connection that everyone shared with themselves and as a grieving community and as humans, I found so fascinating and beautiful. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, part of it too was that we can cultivate this within ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so I think that oftentimes people seek this out because they think they can't. And I believe that you right. can. It takes mm -hmm. time, it takes dedication, it takes practice but you can start cultivating a relationship. It is not the same. You know, I think a lot of people think, oh, if I go see a medium, then I'll feel better about the grief. No, you have to do both. Yeah, um, I think it allows you to work with your grief in a, mm -hmm. in a better way, in a deeper way. I think some of the things we have to get out of the way in order to access these experiences though, are things like anger and guilt and regret. While Yes. good experiences with mediums can help us work through some of that. I'm not sure we can be fully open to them if we're still kind of in those those places with it, you know? Um, I know for myself, I just wasn't ready to invite my, my mom in to a spiritual relationship because I was still so hung up on our on our human relationship and the things I had done wrong and the things that I wished were different. And until I was able to kind of let some of those go and open up to this different idea of a relationship with her, I didn't have one, you know? Well, and I think too, when, when I think about that, like from a clinical perspective and a spiritual perspective, mm -hmm. what I think about is you're still in those kind of lower vibrational states, right? right. And so you can't connect from a higher vibrational state if you're really stuck in a low vibrational state. Right. So you do have to move through those. And sometimes a medium can help do that, right? Like if you have the experience of a medium saying, you know, your mom says you don't need to be angry anymore and it's really important you let that go or mm -hmm. you aren't responsible for this or whatever it is that someone is still holding on to. And then you can do the work of therapy to right. resolve that. Yeah. And then you can integrate the spirituality to open up. Mm -hmm. No, I totally agree. I've seen I've seen people. I, I work closely with a medium friend named Fleur, who I think you know of, and um, we send each other clients. You know, she sends me people who have a good medium reading but still need a lot of work to do in their mm -hmm. grief, and then I'll send her people who have done a lot of grief work, but a, a medium reading could really be that final piece that could really help them. Mm -hmm. um, and we talk about the the tandem work of it all the time. But you know, you and I are rare as as you know licensed clinical professionals who are really open and encouraging of this kind of healing mm -hmm. modality. Um, do you get criticism? Do you ever feel like, how do you, um, how is that going for you? <laughs> if I do, I don't know about it. So not 
outwardly. I mean, I don't know what people are saying behind my back on the blacktop at school, um, <laughs> but which was a big fear of mine as well. But uh, I don't really, you know, when I when I put out this podcast, my very closest friend is one of the physicians that refers to me. Mm -hmm. I have another physician and I reached out to both of them and I said, hey, I just want you to know this in the event that you get a client who looks me up before they come to see me and they, they see this. Yeah. Um, and because I was really concerned. And I think what part of my mission was because I feel like certainly in my community and in, in the space in Chicago, um, people who know me personally know how grounded I am and I'm not kind of totally out there and my house isn't full of crystals, although I have some like hidden behind me. Um, <laughs> but that, you know, the sort of stereotype of what someone who's, I say like woo woo or hooey wooey looks like, yeah. I don't fit that bill. And so I think it's, it's allowed people to open up a little bit more and just be curious with me. And that's really what I want. Like I'm not, when I got to a place where I could say, this isn't about me being right or wrong, that this is true or not true. Right. It's just about me being curious and bringing other people on this journey with me. And if it can help you, great. And if it's not for you, that's fine too. I'm not gonna shove it down your throat. This yeah. Is all on a journey here to kind of figure this all out. And if I can help people yeah. figure it out, Yes. I totally agree. That's how I feel as well. I feel like I just want people to feel permission to be curious, feel permission to, you know, explore different things. I, I, I always think of it as a stage of grief, you know, like exploring spirituality, exploring what you believe in. I really, I really think it's a part of the grieving process. It's really hard to lose someone significant in your life and not wonder why, where are they? Will I see them again? Can they see me? I, I rarely meet someone who's not grappling with those questions. Yet I think a lot of people feel like they can't really ask them like, or they ask them, but they shut them down really fast because they can't, it's hard to find the answers or it's hard to even find somewhat of an answer, right? To these mm -hmm. things, it's a lot of unknowable stuff. And so I feel like a lot of people don't even let themselves ponder it, even though those questions are simmering somewhere in the background for them. And so for me too, like, I just want to encourage people to be curious. Well, and I think what's so exciting for me and, and really part of what I strive to do with my podcast is find researchers who are looking into this from a real scientific perspective. Yeah. So you and I were talking a little bit before, but Bruce Grayson, who is at the University of Virginia Perceptual Studies, his book right here is called After, and he studies um, near-death experiences. Mm -hmm. So what they can tell us about what happens when we die. I just interviewed someone uh, who, who studies shared crossings. He's got a new book out called, my kids, my kids tease me that I have a death library. That's what they call it. I have one too. My kids also feel the same. <laughs> um, at Heaven's Door. Yes, okay. Um, and so this is about shared crossings and shared crossings are when our loved one dies and we're either sitting with them or remotely we know it doesn't even have to be a loved one. Someone in our lives dies and we know they die or they come to us as they're leaving this plane or you know, we get a sign right after. Um, these are all sort of fall under this new category that's just being researched called shared crossings. So it includes shared death experiences, which is when you're sitting bedside with someone and Maybe you feel like the walls changing or geometry, or you feel yourself out of your body, which people report. And so that research is fascinating to me because a lot of the near death experience research talks about the chemicals that could be released in your brain that are causing this experience. And then you're coming back and reporting on that. But the mm -hmm. shared death experiencers are not dying. So they don't have those same chemicals being released. So right, how do you right. explain that? That's so interesting. I'm going to I'm going to dive into these books um, right when we hang up um, this that there's a question that's in the chat that that seems really appropriate for for right now. Um, but she's wondering when it's appropriate um, 
or could we discuss the, the connection of anxiety and grief? And I think that's a really important connection because it really relates to this work. Like you said, it really diminished your, your anxiety when you began to open up to the spiritual side. Can you speak a little bit about what you're seeing in terms of that? Well, I think that underlying so much of our anxiety in life is fear of death. Um, and I think, you know, if, if the past two years haven't been enough evidence of that. Right. Um, and so when we start to kind of to really embrace death as like a part of this continuum that doesn't end when the physical body dies, but that can move on. I think a lot of that anxiety can diminish because you can accept that this is a transition. Now, saying that caveat. I am, I am actually not afraid to die. I am petrified of losing people that I love, even though I have this belief system, because the physical, the emotional pain of that is not avoidable, even if you have this belief system. Right. Yeah. I feel similarly. When I became, I had, I had a, a lot of anxiety following the deaths of my parents in my 20s, and I, I did a lot of work on it, and I had gotten to a really great place with it where I was not as anxious as I had been for a long time. And I had a lot of tools and then I had my first kid and it all came like roaring back even worse than it had ever been because suddenly I had this person that I was so afraid to lose or for her to lose me. And that's really become, you know, that's still my greatest anxiety. Not that I'm not, I'm not really afraid of dying. And I definitely don't want to lose more people and go through that kind of pain. But my deepest fear is that I will die and my children will have to go through pain of that. Mm -hmm. And so even my spiritual understandings don't really help with that. What do you like? How do you yeah. work with that? Yeah, because I think we're human, right? And so mm -hmm. when I think about, okay, from the soul level, the soul still has to do the work of we chose again, this is a belief system that I have not espousing this on anybody else, but I believe that we our souls have chosen this path. And so when I can shift into a place of, okay, why is this here for my soul to grow? Mm -hmm. Then I can let go of, I can begin to let go of that anxiety. But for me, yeah, my deepest fear is something's going to happen to my kids and I'm going to have to live with that pain. Yeah. Uh, and so I do feel like I could handle just about anything else, but that feels like it will just sideline me um, yeah. for life. And so, but I try to come back to, and again, this is the spiritual practice and the work is like, I trust that I will be okay. I trust that I will be okay. Yeah. No matter what happens to me, I trust that I will be, that I'm supported and loved by whatever else there is Yeah. and that it's going to be okay. That doesn't mean it won't be painful and right. excruciating and that I won't be sidelined, but eventually I will get to a place where I'm okay. And right. I think having interviewed so many people who have gone through loss, tragic loss, they, they're they never the same, mm -hmm. but they, they are okay. They can right. function, they can live, they find meaning again, right? David Kessler's work about finding meaning. Mm -hmm. They're able to do that in some way. Yeah. So but it's it's not easy and it's it's a constant practice you know I'm, you're saying my favorite word which is practice you know it isn't the, it is never this one and done thing you can have a profound spiritual experience and it's not a one and done you're not like you're not going to sail through the rest of your life constantly connected to spirit you know it's right. something that you have to practice and keep coming back to um, well, I remember even after like Ram Das had his stroke and then, and he, and he always talked about how in that moment of having his stroke, like everything left him and he was just as a human, like really terrified. Um, and right. all of his spiritual stuff over all his decades of work was just gone in that moment, which I find really relatable and heartening and like, yeah, it's a practice that we have to come back to. Yeah. And I, I mean, I spent 17 years in therapy. So if this is not like I just right. had a brief stint. And then I've been doing all this other work on exploring this and I have a meditation practice and it's not perfect. It's not every day. It just is when it can be. Right. And, and so I go with that and I try not to beat myself up over the fact that, you know, it could be different or it should be different. It just is what I can manage yeah on a day-to-day -day basis absolutely 
Um, let's see. Here's a great question that I get a lot too. Um, Someone wants to know, there are many people that advertise themselves as an intuitive medium. Some of these people are scams. How do I find an authentic medium? So um, Forever Family Foundation is a great resource. Do you know them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, when I was when I was doing my after this book, I, I did. I went to like one of their conferences. It was really great. Yeah. And so um, Bob Ginsburg, who's this who started that is wonderful. He lost a daughter as well and sadly recently lost his wife who he started it with um, and was having similar experiences, like feeling like he wanted to understand spiritually what happened. And so he started this Forever Family Foundation and they certify mediums. So it's not like the most formal process, mm -hmm. but they need to bring mediums through a process and they are pretty um, discriminating. So some of the mediums are some of the best ones out there. Marilyn yeah. Jackson is one of their mediums. Um, and then there's also, um, um, what are they called? Um, you probably know, you might have, it might have been in your book. Um, gosh, they're that, in Arizona, I think. Or, yeah, yeah, I know what you're talking about. It's it's slipping my mind too. Night, Night Bridge or something bridge. Windbridge Institute. Windbridge, yes, yes, Windbridge yeah. Institute. Thank you. Yeah, they've done all those studies on mediums. Yeah, mm -hmm. that, that's that's super interesting. I'm gonna put this in the chat. Um, but those are good places. Um, you know, what do you? I think sometimes there are mediums out there that are scammers, and I think also sometimes they're just not a good fit for you. And it's not necessarily that they're a bad medium, but that the connection isn't there between you and them, you know? But I do, I do think they're scammers for sure, but I also think they're not always scammers. No, and a lot of people right now are, it does seem like Bob Ginsburg actually wrote a book from the Family Foundation called The Medium Explosion, um, because it does seem like there's a lot of people out there hanging up a shingle and saying that they're a medium. And um, I actually have a friend right now who's putting together it's called the Seeking Center, where she's working as well to really make sure that the practitioners that she's recommending are well vetted. Mm -hmm. um, she worked for Oprah for years, so she has a lot of connections in the spiritual space that are really helping to ensure that there aren't people out there taking advantage because a lot of people charge a lot of money for this and it should be a powerful, meaningful experience. It should be. And you said the word integrity earlier on, and I feel like that's a really important aspect of this. When people are grieving and in such a vulnerable state um, and going through this profound life shift of losing someone, I think integrity is so important. But, you know, I, I also think that compassion and I think that mediums you know, mediums who've been really immersed in this work for a long time, they do have a different spiritual understanding of the world. And I think that death isn't as scary for them or as permanent as the people who are coming to see them feel. And so having a respect for that, I think is really important. Just remembering um, what the people who are coming are, are experiencing, because it's not necessarily what those mediums are experiencing. And I, I know I've seen James von Prague a couple of times, and I always felt like he had a really like compassionate respect for the people. My friend Fleur has so much integrity and is always really working so hard to, to think about what they're needing, what they're going through, you know, her clients and not necessarily what her world is like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I think the longer you do the work of being a medium, it seems like the less kind of connected you might might be to the human realm in that way. Right. And yeah. so I do think, and that was part of what pushed me to not want to do the work, even though I loved being in that space because it felt not human. I mean, it really feels really good to be connected yeah. to something greater and not, it feel it's a, it's almost like my brain like shifts over and opens up mm -hmm. and then the information comes in. And so when I have to come back into the human realm space, it does feel different. And so when you're in that space up here all the time, I would imagine it feels disconnected from the human experience. And I felt like I really enjoy working with people in their human grapplings. I don't yeah. want to say no, I do too. I've found I've come to this point where I feel like there's just so much beauty in the human experience of pain and loss and grief. And I know most people aren't feeling that in the moment, but from where I'm sitting and all the experience 
experience I'm having with it and seeing other people through it, I think there's, I think it's just so transformative. It's part of our experience as growing as human beings and it's so painful, um, but it's also part of this life that we're experiencing. What about um, suffering? Um, I think a lot of people really fear suffering at end of life, yet mm -hmm. a lot of mediums I speak to will talk about like when they connect with someone who maybe suffered from a long illness at the end of life, they're like, oh my God, that's not even any part of what they're, what's happening for them now. Or people who have had mental illness or addiction or died by suicide, you know, the mediums I've spoken to seem to intimate that those those things were very human experiences that have not at all translated to where they are now. What yeah. is your understanding of that? Yeah, my understanding is pretty similar that that, that is the experience of being embodied mm -hmm. versus being disembodied. And you know, one of the things I've often asked some of the people I've interviewed is like, why do we have to be embodied? Mm -hmm. Why can't we just be disembodied entities and like experience, you know, whatever it is? And the answers that I've always gotten are because like, how does chocolate, I love chocolate. How does chocolate taste to you? Yeah. Um, what is it like to watch a sunset? Those aren't experiences you can get being disembodied per se, mm -hmm. because they're human experiences. Yeah. And so we have to have all of those things, including the, the pain of, of being human. Um, but that when, and I think that this is where it's hard for people because we try to put words to it because we're human, mm -hmm. but there's not words to describe as my understanding right. what it is like over there behind mm -hmm. the veil, whatever, wherever it is you, we go. Um, and even people who come back from near death experiences say it's ineffable. I can't describe what it was. It just, yeah. it's like this knowing. And so we want to understand it conceptually in our human minds, the suffering and did they feel pain and was that, but that's a human experience. That's not a soul experience. Yeah. Did that answer? Yeah. What no, I think that makes sense. What um what is your belief system around past lives? Like what is when you're like, um, I don't know, where have you landed currently with that? <laughs> um, that's a good question. I, you know, I go back and I do believe in it. Um, I believe we've had past lives. I've done several past life regressions, I've done between life regressions. I'm always like, that's just my mind making can I swear on here? Yeah, okay. please. I'm just like, I'm, is that just my mind like making shit up all yeah. the time? Um, but I, I think there has to be something to it. I mean, when I look at weird Brian Weiss's work, which is remarkable, I don't know how you deny that experience. And if we think of the soul as like, it never dies, it just continues on and chooses to reincarnate in a body to learn lessons and experience humanity and help maybe grow people and move people forward uh i think it makes perfect sense yeah but then when i'm like in that moment sometimes i'm like oh, does it like maybe this is it maybe it's just like one and done um but then i do always come back to the spiritual practices that i have and i was telling you earlier like sometimes as i get away from it i'll literally say come on show me show me something, I need something. And then I'll get kind of whacked on the head and it'll be like, really? Like, do we need to keep showing you? Are you not convinced that? <laughs> um, but sometimes I lose my way too. You know, I get yeah. really caught up in being human. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, I love the idea of past lives. Like, I think it sounds very comforting and very interesting. And, you know, I love, you know, I just love all the like kind of pop culture around it too. Like, or just the idea that like someone's an old soul or like, wow, this person is like really just here for the first time. <laughs> this, you know, the ways we can attribute these, these ideas to people around us. I, I like it, but I'm, I'm not sure. I've had some past life regressions too. And I'm like, eh, am I making this up or... Yeah. What is this? Um, but then you read some of these works and the and the literature and the research, and that is so, is very interesting and mind blowing. Yeah, and I think you know how I think of all of these techniques is they're techniques and tools, and they're here to help grow our this soul now in this human body. Mm -hmm. And so, if you have a past life regression, and in that regression, you learn that you were, um, I don't know. Uh, I can't even think of one like a 
like in, in one of my past life regressions, I was a, I think I was like a Indian fighting, like a, I guess a Native American fighting. And I remember like my death was like, I got shot in the back with an arrow and had a lot of pain in my back. And I had to release, and the person who shot me was my friend. And so it was about forgiveness of people and how you can for, be more forgiving, right? And so it's right. like the lesson that I then take into this life right? that I need to be applying now. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, I found even if I was undecided on whether these things were real, there were some, still some really interesting lessons to think about and to apply to my life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For someone listening who's, um, you know, curious, like what are some simple things someone can do to just start to open themselves up to all of this or start to raise their vibration or like, you know, what, what kinds of daily practices would you recommend? Meditation is always the best. I feel like people are. I know. Like, Every time I say it to him, like, sorry, but it's meditation. <laughs> I, know, I know. It's like, oh, can't come up with anything better. I know. Um, being in nature. Um, and I think just opening up a conversation, start mm -hmm. talking to your loved one as if they're here. You know, mm -hmm. that's, that was what my teacher years ago said to me. She said, talk, keep the conversation going. Talk to your aunt because it takes a lot for them to lower their vibration and us to raise our vibration and meet in the middle. Hmm. So if you can just start the conversation, that's a great place to begin. And, and so now I'll still do that. I'll talk to my aunt. She's not as present for me, although she, she did show up a couple of weeks ago in a dream. Um, but normally, like she hasn't been very present for me in a long time because I really believe she kind of guided me and brought me to where I needed to go and then was like, you're good. I, you know, and she might be busy doing some other stuff now. Right. Too. <laughs> I hope she is because um, the world needs it. But I think that um, that that conversation is still so important to have and to ask for signs. You know, that's what a lot of the mediums talk about is just ask mm -hmm. for signs and, and be open to what's going to show up for you. And and when you do that, you can be really specific. But then also, if you're specific, be open to how that specificity might show up. So you might say, like, I really want um, a turtle. And it's, it might not be like a turtle crossing the road. It might be a turtle in a picture or you're reading a book and the word turtle is mentioned. Or yeah. like it just seems like eh, that's a little that's a little odd. Like I wouldn't expect that to have been there. Yeah. Um, and so, and then you start to, and then that curiosity propels more curious. Mm -hmm. No, I like that. Um, we're getting close on time, but someone wants to know, can you talk a little bit more about soul and what does that mean for you? What is it? So I feel like, gosh, I've had so many different people talk about soul. What is my belief of the soul? It's, it's an energy um, that inhabits our body for a period of time and that energy eventually leaves our body but the the consciousness of that mm -hmm. um and so i just i wish i had this question before so i could have had a, a it's a tough one though it's a really hard answer. Yeah. i know i know um i think that it's um yeah it's just an energy that is that is here and that continues to grow and evolve over time. Mm -hmm. Now, what that looks like, again, seems difficult because I don't know that we can put it in like human thought. Yeah. But then, but then I also think like, is a soul one or is a soul universal? Because when we kind mm -hmm. of return to this place of whatever it is, and people said like they feel one with source or one with God, you know, are we just a piece of that that's broken off and comes into a body? Yeah. I don't know, but it's yeah. all like fascinating for me to think about. And, and it's so interesting. I think it's hard to get our minds around a little bit. Um, I, I remember I was doing a shamanic workshop in like Montana some years ago, and I had an experience. We had to call in our spirit animal and ask the spirit animal to dismember us, which was like, Ooh. you know, like, <laughs> really um, take us out. And I had my spirit animal was a bear. And in my vision or whatever I was doing, the, you know, the, the bear just like completely destroyed me. Yet 
I wasn't gone. And so I had this and I and I, I had this vision where I was looking down at like Claire Bidwell Smith yet I was something else. I was still here. And I was like, oh, and I had this real moment of like, okay, I'm in this soul place right now. And that's this kind of human I've been experiencing, you know, right. this yeah. lifetime, <laughs> but that's not entirely who I am. And there's right. so much more. And I go back to that idea a lot because it was a very profound moment and feeling for me. And whenever I'm trying to find that space again, I can think about that time if that makes any sense i know that probably sounds really crazy no it makes it makes complete sense to me because this is the world i love to live in but yeah, yeah and i think you know i always find like i want to go back and hold on to that experience because it's yeah. so profound and it feels so it felt so good i was yeah. so i didn't want to come we had to go back into our bodies and i was like i don't want to this is great over here well and i think you know because I've been meditating for many years, I can now get myself to that experience where I can be out of my body. And I'm always like, oh, like I really have to go back in that. Like yeah, it just yeah. feels so constraining and confining to me. Yeah. Um, and it just feels good to be like expansive and. Mm -hmm. Yep. Sorry, guys. Meditation. It's meditation. Right. <laughs> um, last question. Let's see. Do you think children are more connected to the spirit world? And if so, why? Yes. Um, for a number of reasons. One, they're closer to it because they just left it. Two, because they are not filtering in the same way that as adults we are. Right. Yeah. I think I think there's research that like around six or seven is when kids kind of start to shift away from the spirit world and lose their ability to connect in that way. Mm -hmm. And there's some research out that says like even imaginary friends, like all of those, those experiences that kids talk about are like, oh, I just, a lot of times people have reported that they'll be at a funeral and a kid will say, oh, there's grandpa sitting in the corner. Or like even at my aunt's Shiva, I think my cousin came up and said, aunt Linda's in the basement. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people dismiss that as like, oh, that's, that's not a big deal. They're, they're just being a kid, like they're making this up. But I do believe they have an ability to connect because they're not, they're not in a place of judgment or. Right. They're not getting in their own way in the way that we do. We right. like overthink everything. We overanalyze everything. We have experiences that have, you know, shaped what we feel like we can think about. Um, yeah. That makes a lot of sense. One, wait, wait, I got to ask this last question because I think it's so important um, to answer. Are mediums who do readings online, are they real or a scam? And this is interesting because people always ask me like, oh, I don't want to talk to them on the phone or online. But I'm like, no, 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 it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> Can you yeah. speak to that? It's just energy. That's, yeah. that's what they're picking up on. So yeah, it's totally fine. I mean, I do think you know, I think people are right to be skeptical when they give their name to a medium. Um, you know, oftentimes people might give just a first name or not their mm -hmm. full name. And I think that's totally yeah, appropriate. I think that's because right. you, yeah, because you want to have an experience that feels authentic. Mm -hmm. And I think if you give your full name, you're going to doubt, right? You're going to be like, oh, wait, no, I, sh this person looked me up on Instagram and they saw that, you know, I have a whole page about how my mom died and that was very difficult. So I think trying to keep the experience as clean and authentic as possible. I agree, just for yourself. So you're, yeah. you, can, you can let yourself believe or not believe. But I think that um, psychic mediums can do exactly what they do, either in person or on the phone or on Zoom. I don't think you need to be physically in front of them at all, because what they're doing anyway is not physical, you know, so. Right. Um, I really don't think it's, I think it's fun to be in person for sure. I would always prefer that in general, but it's yeah. not necessary. And when I get messages, I never have anybody in front of me. Yeah. I just get messages and they just come in and I am like, okay, let me just disperse this to whomever I think it yeah. was, it was for. For sure. Oh, this has been so much fun. Um, we have to continue the conversation. Um, I would love that. In lots of ways. Um, I'm so appreciative to Reimagine and Dara and all of you guys who are here today with such great questions. And um, we can find you what on Instagram, your podcast. Um, Dara's put up the links for it. And you and I are going to talk about you writing a book soon. Yeah. <laughs> um, You're so. going to have to mentor me. I'm, I'm, I'm on it. I'm, I'm ready. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm on Instagram at Dr. Amy Robbins. Um, my podcast is 
drops every Thursday. I've got so much content. It's like exploding. Um, so please listen awesome. and reach out. I love just hearing people's experiences and hearing how they're transformed and how they're opening up as a result of, of this. So awesome. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, everybody. Have Thanks, a good day. Thank you, Claire. Yeah. Um, and, and also just for everyone, um, you know, I put the links in the chat, which you can copy and we'll also send out an email with information. And I just wanted to also call out some events um, in the chat that uh, we have planned for January that I recommend. Um, I'm just looking at oh. the Yeah. Okay, and we'll, we'll um, Claire and Amy, if there's anything else you want to share out, um, you could just send it along and we'll make sure to include it in the email. Yeah, but we're um, so appreciative of all of you guys for everything and just, um, you know, being open to this. Keep being curious. Thank you, everybody, for coming during your lunch hour and or whatever, breakfast hour, I guess, depending <laughs> on where you are. All right, guys. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.